great to see a Purpose Church. Today we're continuing our series, Seeing Jesus Through the Eyes of Luke. With today's study, we come now to Luke chapter 6 and 7. And so we're always taking uh, something out of whatever passage we're reading as we read through Luke, going about two chapters at a time. Uh, then I'll preach something out of that section. Uh, and today we're coming to chapter 6 and 7. We're going to talk about disappointment with God. Uh, Satan's three favorite weapons against the believer are what I call the three D's, doubt, discouragement, and disappointment. The three D's, uh, favorite weapons in Satan's arsenal against followers of Jesus, doubt, discouragement, and disappointment. And today we're going to talk about disappointment. I, I see so many people Stop following Jesus because they have some disappointment with God. Something happens in their life. They wonder, how could God allow that? Or how could God not do that for me? And they get disappointed with God. And it's like a, like a poison in their relationship with God. They eventually fall away because of that disappointment. Uh, George Foreman, who we know for boxing, grills, and Jesus. He's a pastor now. I love this quote from George Foreman. He said, evil lurks where disappointment lodges. Oh, is that true? Evil lurks where we allow disappointment. Nothing wrong with feeling disappointment. We feel disappointment all the time. And yet when we allow it to lodge in our hearts, that's where evil uh, lurks. So we're going to look at five causes for our disappointment. Uh, five causes for our disappointment and then the antidote to each one. An antidote is a medicine taken or given to counteract a particular poison. And in this case, we'll look for five antidotes to counteract the poison of uh, disappointment with God in five different areas. The first three causes are from the Old Testament, and then the last two will be from our section, uh, Luke 7 specifically, uh, with those last two causes. So number one, the number one uh, reason, or a reason, uh, uh, number one of the reasons for disappointment with God is our own foolish choices. Uh, Solomon said in Proverbs 19, verse 3, uh, a person's own folly, that is our own bad decisions, our own foolish choices, leads to their ruin. We get consequences from the bad decision that we made. Yet, their heart rages against the Lord. I've seen this so many times in my own life and in the lives of others we make bad choices and then we blame God for the outcome of that. Uh, we have this human tendency to blame other people and to ignore our own faults, just to, as Jesus talked about, to see the speck in somebody else's eye and ignore the beam or the log that's in our own eye. And so we have this human tendency to blame others, to ignore our own faults uh, with other people and we do the same thing with God. We, 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 our own folly leads us into trouble, and then we turn around and blame God. Years ago, in our culture, we began rebelling against the idea that another person could judge us. Uh, nobody should judge me. Nobody judge me. And now we've progressed, or I don't know if progress is the right word, regressed, uh, digressed. We've gone on in that in our culture to saying that even God can't judge us. Other people can't judge us. God can't judge us. We, we only answer to ourselves, and we are rarely, if ever, wrong. I love myself. I think I'm grand. I go to the movie and hold my hand. I slip my arm around my waist. If I get fresh, I slap my face. And so we love ourselves, and we ignore. Uh, we're, we're obsessed with ourselves, and we put ourselves up on a pedestal and nobody can judge us, and even God uh, can't judge us. And so the antidote to this is I need to own my decisions before God. I need to, to own up to, to my own decisions and the results or the consequences of the results that it causes in my life. Uh, David is such a great example of this. After he was a murderer, an adulterer, he says in Psalm 51 verse 4, against you, you only God, have I sinned? I own what I did. That's why David was a man after God's own heart. He was certainly not a perfect man. He was a very flawed man. And yet he owned up to the results, the consequences 
of his own decisions. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you are, you God, he's talking to God here, you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. Now, the second reason for our disappointment with God is we exaggerate the benefits of not following God. And there's a guy in the Bible named Asaph, uh, and he writes about this, his experience in Psalm 73. And boy, I'm sure, like me, you're going to be able to identify with what Asaph is feeling here. He says in, in verse 1, Surely God is good to Israel. He, he knows in his head God is good to those who are pure in heart. For the, I, I know following God is the right thing to do. I, I know He's good. I know God is good. But as for me, here's the problem. My feet had almost slipped. I had nearly lost my foothold. Why? For I envied the arrogant. He looked around, compared his life to others that weren't following God. He was trying with all of his heart to follow God, looked around at others that weren't, and he begins to envy them. When I saw the prosperity of the wicked, life is so much better for those that are not following God. I mean, didn't it complicate your life when you began to follow Jesus? All of a sudden, you don't get up every morning and say, uh, Glenn, what, what, what do I want to do today? Well, just do whatever you want to do. Now, you answer to God. You answer to the Lordship of Jesus. Uh, but you look around. He says, now he begins to exaggerate. They have no struggles. Of course, that's not true. Their bodies are healthy and strong. Of course, that's not always true. They are free from common human burdens. Uh, they are not plagued by human ills. And so in his discouragement, in his disappointment with God, he exaggerates uh, the lives and the benefits of those that are not following God. And yet there is some truth in what Asaph is saying here. In the short term, Asaph is absolutely right. <laughs> Did you know that the Bible teaches that sin is pleasurable? Do you know that? He's like, that's in the Bible? Oh, yeah. Bible teaches uh, in Hebrews 11, verse 25, it says, it says that sin is pleasurable. It, it is fun. If you aren't having fun when you're sinning, you're not doing it right. <laughs> if you're not having fun when you're sinning, uh, something's wrong. You're not doing it right. The Bible teaches that sin is pleasurable. But here's the key, what it says in Hebrews 11, 25. It's, so it talks about the pleasures of sin are fleeting, okay? They're there. It's just short term. Or I love the old King James translation said, for a season. Oh, yeah. Sin works out great for you for a season, fleeting, for a period of time, for the, the short run. And so the antidote is, I need to take the long view rather than the short view, and that leads us to Asaph part two, uh, picking it up with verse 15. If I had spoken out like that, I would have betrayed your children. And when I tried to understand all this, it troubled me deeply. I, let's hold it there for just a second, could we? Troubled me deeply. Can you identify with that? You read something on social media, you see something in the media, you just look around at the lives of others that, that are not following God and it seems to be going so well for them and so hard for you. And it really does, we, we can resonate with Asaph, can't we? It troubles us deeply until what happened. Next verse now. Until I entered the sanctuary of God. What was the antidote? For Asaph, he went to church. He went to church. That's why I'm so glad that you're online with us here, that you're staying connected with the things of God, even with the pandemic and even with all that's going on. You're still going to church in, in the safest, best way for you. And, and, and he went to church. And when you go to church, whether it's online or in person, you get yourself perspective. There he saw the long view when he, when he went into the sanctuary. Then all of a sudden, he gets, a, he gets an attitude adjustment. He gets this perspective adjustment. Then when I went into the sanctuary of God, then when I went to church, when I read the Bible, when I heard God's word proclaimed, 
Then I saw the long view. Then I understood their final uh, destiny. Surely you place them on slippery ground. You cast them down to ruin. So sin is short-term fun, but it is long-term ruin. And following God can be short-term challenging. It can be hard, but it's always long-term blessing. Verse 23, yet I am always with you. You hold me by my right hand. You guide me with your counsel, and afterward you will take me into glory. Heaven in the long run. Uh, joy of eternity with each other and with Christ uh, in the long term. And then number three, the third uh, reason that we get disappointed with God is we don't have the full picture. And we see this in the life of Jacob in Genesis 42, verse 36. Now you're going to think I'm crazy or you're going to think I'm, um, I'm, I'm mean uh, or, or kind of a, a, you wonder what is Glenn talking about here. This is one of my favorite verses in the Bible, but completely because you have to understand the context. It does not look like a great verse. But when you read it in context, oh, this is a wonderful verse. It's about Jacob, and it says, their father Jacob said to them, said to his sons, and I encourage you to read the whole story. If you've never read the story of Jacob and Joseph, it's about uh, Genesis, what, about 38 through 50 or so, uh, chapters 38 through 50 in Genesis. Their father Jacob said to his sons, to them, you have deprived me of my children. Joseph is no more and Simeon is no more. And now you want to take Benjamin. Everything is against me. Everything is uh, against me. Now, um, this, is, uh, this is where we can see it from God's perspective because we're, we're reading the story here and we can understand uh, from God's perspective, why um, Jacob uh, felt like this. He thinks that his son Joseph is dead. Uh, he, his son Simeon is in prison back in Egypt. He thinks his youngest son Benjamin is in danger, and it looks like the whole family is going to starve to death. So from his perspective, you totally understand why he says everything is against me. But when you read the story, you get to have the opportunity to see things from God's perspective. And contrary to what he is feeling there in the moment that everything is against me, actually Joseph is alive, he's not dead. And, and to add to that, he's the second most powerful person in the world. Simeon is safe and will soon be released from prison. Benjamin is safe and his whole family is not gonna starve to death they're about to be moved to live into a place called Goshen, which is the most prosperous piece of planet Earth um, that there is, a most prosperous piece of land on all of planet Earth. And so it can look like everything's against you, but from God's perspective, everything is for you. You just can't see the full picture. He only saw part of the picture. He didn't see the full picture. Oh, this quote from uh, Rosa Parks, it just, it just, your heart just breaks when you hear uh, her, her, her cry here. Uh, Rosa Parks, um, famous for the civil rights movement, um, she visited our church before she died and went to heaven, before she passed away a few years before that. She, she visited our church and she said, there's so, just so much hurt and disappointment in life, in her life and what she uh, she, she resisted and, and had to stand up against. And oppression, there's just so much you can take. The line between reason and madness grows thinner. You, you get like Jacob and you say, everything is against me. But then the words of Dr. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. We must accept finite or temporary disappointment, but never lose infinite or long-term or eternal hope. J.D. Greer writes, God's resolution to our pain will make the oppression seem trivial. Uh, Paul said this as well in 2 Corinthians 4.17. He said, and he had a lot of trouble in his life. Paul had all kinds of hard stuff. And yet he says, you know, he considered those light, he called them light and momentary troubles compared to the glory 
that's going to be revealed in us and through us in heaven someday. God's resolution to whatever pain you're going through, uh, maybe the whole reason you're watching today is just to hear this one point, God's resolution, how he's eventually going to re resolve the hurt and the pain in your life is going to make it when you get to heaven or even later in your life, but when, especially when you get to heaven, it's going to make it seem trivial, uh, Paul said, by comparison. The antidote then is I need to trust that God knows the bigger purpose. We, we see only part of the picture. God sees the whole picture. Uh, Paul writes in Romans 8, 28, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him. Now you hear people say all the time, oh, everything works out for the good. No, it doesn't. It doesn't. Uh, not everything works out for the good but only for those that love God, that have committed their lives to Christ, that have submitted to God's will for their life and, and plan for their lives, who have been called according to his purpose. I'm telling you, when, when I run my life by my purpose, all things don't always work together for good. But when I'm following according to his purpose, Robert Byrne writes, the purpose of life is a life of purpose. The purpose of life is a life of purpose. You know, I was reading the other day about Ann Sullivan. I've got a quote from her right now. And uh, she's most famous as Helen Keller's teacher. Here's Ann Sullivan, and here's Helen Keller. And that's, that's how we kind of know her. She's kind of only famous because she's connected as, with Helen Keller as her teacher. But, you know, her story is quite inspirational as well, what she overcame. Uh, she got, Ann Sullivan got an eye disease at the age of five. And so she was almost completely blind herself. Uh, when she was eight years old, her mother died. So she loses her eyesight, at, at, most of her eyesight, at age five. Her mother dies from tuberculosis when she's eight. Two years later, at the age of 10, her father abandoned her. She's sent to a rundown and an overcrowded house for the poor that was known, later investigated, for its physical and sexual abuse. And so she overcame all all of that. And here's what she wrote. Keep on beginning and failing. Each time you fail, start all over again and you will grow stronger until you have accomplished a purpose. I love this right here. Not the one you began with perhaps. Have you discovered that in your life? That through the ups and downs and the bumps and bruises of life, you thought your purpose was one thing, but through it all, you discover that it's something different, not the one you began with perhaps, but one you'll be glad to remember. She started her life not thinking that her purpose was gonna be to help Helen Keller and, and through that, all the impact that that made in the world. And it was not something that she would have wanted, all the tragedy in her life. And yet all that tragedy drove her towards her ultimate purpose, which actually was a blessing in the end. And the same is true for us as well. Ronald Reagan once said, we are never defeated unless we give up on God. Martin Luther wrote, a faith is a living, daring confidence in God's grace, so sure and certain that a man could stake his life on it a thousand times. A little bit of a tangent here that I, I just thought was interesting that I heard this this week for the first time. Uh, we often get Martin Luther confused with Martin Luther King Jr. There's a reason for that. Martin Luther, he's the great church leader from 500 years ago. Martin Luther King Jr., about 50 years ago. Martin Luther, about uh, 500 years ago. And Kimberly is such a fan of uh, Martin Luther King Jr. So on Monday, as we uh, honored him with his birthday, she uh, kept uh, following me around the house, giving me stories and factoids about um, uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And here's one I had not heard before about how his name, when he was born, if we put his dad and his picture up there, when he was born, his dad was Martin Luther, My Michael King, was Michael King Sr. His dad was a pastor, Michael King Sr. And then his son was Michael King Jr. But then in 1934, when the father was 35 and the son, uh, Martin, uh, Luke, uh, my, at that point, Michael uh, King Jr. was five years old. Uh, he makes a trip, his dad makes a trip to Germany and was so inspired by the life of Martin Luther from 500 years before 
that he comes back to Atlanta and changes his name from Michael King to Martin Luther King Sr. and changes the name of his five-year-old son from Michael King to Martin Luther King uh, Jr. And uh, I just thought that was so fascinating and explains why sometimes we get the two names and the two people uh, confused with each other. Uh, okay, let's go on. Uh, as we finish up this one, we don't have the full picture. And so the antidote is I need to trust that God knows the bigger purpose. And so what we do is we're faithful with the part of the picture that we do see until we see the full picture. Be faithful with the, the part of the picture you do see until you see the full picture. Um, uh, Kimberly calls these pathetic old man stories, all right, <laughs> where I relive the glory days from 50 years ago and 50 pounds ago. Uh, when I used to run track, but do you have a story in your life, um, maybe many stories from your childhood or youth, that, and you kind of use those as a motivator or as a template uh, to give perspective to what you're going through throughout life. And, and let me just tell you this one, I, I, it, it's kind of a personal story, but think about your stories that you kind of go to time and time again. And this is one of those for me. When I was um, a freshman and sophomore in high school, in the state of Virginia, where I grew up, you couldn't run both the mile and the two mile in a meet because they were only 45 minutes apart and it was considered too stressful for young runners. And so you weren't allowed to run the mile and the two mile um, in the same meet, track meet. But then they changed the rule when I became a junior. And so all these Virginians for the first time were trying to run the mile and two mile in the same track meet, even though they were 45 minutes apart and never done it at the district meet level, anybody in Virginia. And so it was all kind of new territory. It was for me. And so I get to the district meet, the, one of the bigger meets, and ran the mile, and then 45 minutes later was going to run the two mile. Now, my arch rivals were from a high school called Midlothian, uh, which is one of the suburbs of Richmond, Virginia. And so my two rivals were from there. So what they did is I ran both mile and two mile, but they took one runner and put him in the mile against me, and then the other runner was fresh uh, to run, not didn't run the mile, but ran, was fresh to run the two mile against me. So ran the mile, 45 minutes, run the two mile. The runner from Midlothian immediately gets literally a 100-yard lead. And so after a half a mile, I'm 100 yards behind. So I thought to myself, uh, you know, this is just, this is the new territory. It's just impossible to do well in both the mile and the two mile on the same day. It's too hard to do. But what I determined to do is to just forget how far ahead he was and just put one foot in front of the other for the next mile and a half. Just said, you know what? I don't think I'm gonna be able to catch him, but just persevere, even the, don't get discouraged, just run your race one foot in front of the other. And lo and behold, just did that for a mile and I look up with a half a mile to go and he's right there. Passed him with the half a mile yet to go at the one and a half mile mark. And, and I always go back to that story thinking, you know, there are some times in your life, like the pandemic that we're just going through, where you just try to be faithful to God one step at a time, just, just day in, day out. And what's gonna happen is one day we're gonna look up and lo and behold, the pandemic is going to be over. It's going to be over. And so we just faithfully plod along, even when you're tempted to be discouraged. If you look up, it seems like Jacob, everything's against me, but you just persevere. And lo and behold, it's going to be over. And we're going to look back and see what God did in and through us uh, during that time. Okay, the fourth reason for uh, disappointment with God is we've done the right thing and it's turned out wrong. Have you ever done the right thing and it turns out badly for you? Well, that's what happened to John the Baptist. In Luke 7, verse 18, John the Baptist's disciples told Jesus about all these things. And uh, John's disciples told him, I'm sorry, told him, John the Baptist, about all the things that Jesus was doing, all the miracles he was doing, and calling two of them, uh, John the Baptist sent them to the Lord Jesus to ask, are you the one who is to come 
or should we expect someone else? When the men came to Jesus, they said, John the Baptist sent us to you to ask, are you the one who is to come or should we expect someone else? Uh, John the Baptist was disappointed with Jesus. I mean, hey, he, he thought Jesus was going to come as a conqueror, as a, as a conqueror over the Romans, as, a, as the conqueror over the world. And hey, if you're the campaign manager, when your guy gets elected, you expect a, a spot, a job in his administration. And he's disappointed because where was John the Baptist at this point? He was in prison on his way to an execution, to eventually being executed. So he thought Jesus was going to come as a conqueror. He was going to reap the rewards of that. And here he is in prison. And this could lead to depression and this could lead to doubt. I mean, after all, one of the prophecies about the Messiah had been that he would release the prisoners. And here is his number one guy, his right-hand man, John the Baptist, is in prison. Uh, John the Baptist had heard about the miracles, but he had actually never seen any of them himself. So Jesus is doing all these miracles for other people, but he wasn't doing them for John the Baptist, this great man. And he was family as well. John the Baptist was Jesus' cousin. So Jesus is doing all these miracles for everybody else, and he doesn't even do it for his own family member. Doesn't even do it for his forerunner, his, 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 his number one guy. And, and this discouraged him, disappointed him, and he begins to think, well, maybe Jesus isn't the one after all. Do you ever feel this way? Why is God doing all these miracles for other people and he hasn't done one for me? Uh, this should be such an encouragement to us, the story of John the Baptist. Here's one of the greatest men of God that ever lived, and yet even he struggled with doubt. But here's the antidote. I need to run back to the facts behind my faith. When, when I don't understand it, I run back to the facts behind my faith. Verse 21, at that very time, Jesus cured many who had diseases, sicknesses, and evil spirits and gave sight to many who were blind. So he replied to the messengers, go back and report to John what you have seen and heard the facts behind your faith. Uh, the blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. In the original Greek, this word stumble means to fall away. Blessed are those who don't get disappointed with God and as a result, fall away, or the other meaning behind it is come to ruin. When we allow disappointment with God to lodge in our hearts and, and we begin to drift away from Him, fall away from Him, it eventually will lead us to come to ruin. I mean, don't you get discouraged by people attacking the gospel? When you hear people attacking the gospel of Jesus, doesn't that discourage you? Well, I love this quote by Charles Spurgeon, about how we should not be intimidated by those that uh, criticize uh, our, our faith or, or ridicule the gospel. He says, he who would place himself in front of a fast-moving railway car will be crushed and would be no more foolish than you who are opposing the gospel. If the gospel is true, truth is mighty and it will prevail. Who are you to attempt to stand against it? You will be crushed. But let me tell you, when the railway car runs over you, the wheel will not be raised even an inch by your size. Poor creatures, they're like a gnat who thinks he can quench the sun. Go, tiny insect, and do it if you can. You will only burn your wings and die. Likewise, there may be a fly who thinks it could drink the ocean dry. Drink the ocean if you can, O oh fly. More likely, you will sink in it, and it will drink you. The gospel is true whether people believe it or not. The gospel is true whether people are critical of it or ridicule it or not. Nothing can withstand it. And so when we get disappointed with God and we get discouraged like John the Baptist was, when we do the right thing and it turns out hard, 
We do the right thing and it turns out wrong. You, you look to the facts uh, behind your faith. Run back to them like Jesus encouraged John the Baptist to do. And then number five, our final one, reason we get disappointed with God is we have not accepted God's authority in our life. I mean, this happened to the Pharisees. Uh, Luke 7, verse 29. All the people, even the tax collectors, when they heard Jesus' words, acknowledged that God's way was right. Because they had been baptized by John. See, John's baptism was, was one of repentance, but it was one of preparation for the ministry of Jesus. And really what was going on, what, what the baptism of John the Baptist symbolized was a submission to the authority of God. When you got baptized by John the Baptist, it was basically saying, God, I am under your authority and I am open to whatever comes next. And so because the Pharisees had refused that uh, baptism by John, they had not submitted themselves to the authority of God. Therefore, they weren't ready to receive Jesus. It goes on the next verse. But the Pharisees and the experts in the law, ah, oh, is this a sobering verse. They rejected God's purpose for themselves. Oh, don't do that. Don't do that. Don't reject God's purpose for yourself because they had not been baptized uh, by John. But the antidote is I need to be a man or a woman under God's authority. I need to submit to God's authority and, and then I won't fall prey to disappointment with God because I'm under his authority. However my life turns out is up to him, not up to me because I'm under his authority. Uh, we see this in the centurion in Luke 7 verses 1 through 10. When Jesus had finished saying all this to the people, who were listening, he entered Capernaum. There, there, a centurion servant whom his master valued highly was sick and about to die. A centurion commanded about 100 men in a Roman legion, which was about 6,000 soldiers. In today's rank, it would be like a captain or a, a major in, in our army. Verse 3, the centurion heard of Jesus and sent some elders of the Jews to him. This is a remarkable person. Even though he's a Roman centurion, he has friends uh, that are elders of the Jewish people to send to Jesus, asking him to come and to heal his, his servant. When they came to Jesus, they pleaded earnestly with him, this man deserves to have you do this because he loves our nation. This man, a soldier in an occupying force of the Roman Empire over Israel had fallen in love with the nation of Israel, even to the point of building our synagogue. And so Jesus went with them. What a remarkable, remarkable man. Crossing racial divides, racial barriers, and loving the people, seeing himself not as a soldier in an occupying force, but as somebody who was meant to serve the people of the nation of Israel. So Jesus went with them. He was not far from the house when the centurion sent friends to say to him, Lord, don't trouble yourself, for I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. That is why I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you, but say the word and my servant will be healed. This, this is a man of humility. He didn't want to trouble Jesus. He worried, for example, that Jesus might be criticized for going into a Gentile's home. He hoped that Jesus would heal his beloved servant, but he had absolutely no sense of entitlement. And so it says, just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes. And that one, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. Uh, he, he says, I am a, 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 a man under authority, and I have authority over soldiers. And if I tell them to do something, they will do it. And so I see you as having that same authority under God over me in my life, and 
And I believe you can simply say the word and my servant will be healed. You know, Luke keeps saying that the crowds are amazed at Jesus. You'll see that theme through Luke, that the, the, the crowds, the people were amazed at Jesus. But now the tables are turned and it's Jesus' turn to be amazed. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him. And turning to the crowd following him, he said, I tell you, I've not found such great faith even in Israel. Then the men who had been sent returned to the house and found the servant well. What if instead of being disappointed with God, we trusted him, had faith in him, believed in him, placed ourselves under his authority so that when he says go, we go. Um, when, when he says come, we come. When he says do this, we do it because we are under the authority of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we do that with such faith and belief and trust to the point where Jesus is amazed. And as a result, he does amazing things through us and in us. Wouldn't that be wonderful to replace disappointment with God, with God's authority over our lives? And all God's family said, Amen and Amen.